you brought your Bibles this morning, please open them to Mark chapter 10. We're going to see today that the Bible is not just a religious book. The Bible is a source of hope and faith for God's people. And you say, well, do we really need hope and faith? Hope and faith will change your life. Amen. So that's why the Bible is so important to us. Mark 10, let's start reading at verse 46. Then they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a large crowd, a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the road. And when he heard that it was Jesus the Nazarene, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many were sternly telling him to be quiet. But he kept crying all the more, saying, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him here. So they called the blind man, saying to him, Take courage, stand up, he's calling to you. When they turned, I saw this. You notice that? They were rebuking him earlier. <laughs> so verse 50, it says, Throwing aside his cloak, that would be his beggar's cloak, that identified him as a beggar, throwing aside his cloak, he jumped up and came to Jesus, and answering him, Jesus said, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabboni, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he regained his sight, and he began following him on the road. I have one very important question. Could Bartimaeus see himself seen? Inside that dark little world where he lived, could he see himself seen? Absolutely. You know why you know? Because if he couldn't see himself seen, he would never have cried out. If you don't have hope, hope is the image of victory. Hope is that positive expectation. If you don't have hope, you'll never cry out to God. Faith is what gives substance to your hope, but without hope, you never even try. Okay? Let's go to Matthew, chapter 8. Hope is sort of been given a rap, uh, bad rap in word of faith circles because if you just say, oh, I hope so, that's not really faith. But if you're not in hope, you're never going to have faith. You've got to get into hope that it actually can happen before your faith can give substance to your hope. Matthew 8, 1 to 3. When Jesus came down from the mountain, Large crowds followed him. And a leper came to him and bowed down before him and said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing to be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Could this leper imagine himself cleansed and restored to his family? Yeah. Yes, he could. He could see it because if he couldn't have seen it, he would have just sat there and watched his fingers drop off. He could see. That's what happens when you're leprosy. And leprosy can bring you to hopelessness, but he refused to go there. He still had hope. The question is, did these two men, Bartimaeus and the leper, have hope? Yes. Could they look at the future and still see the most positive possible outcome? And what it would be like to be living in their miracle? The leper could see himself with fingers again. See himself hugging his wife. You see, you can't hug your wife. If you're a leper, you are an outcast because it's so contagious. He could see his, his life right again. Hope is when you can look into the Word and see what God has promised you and look into your future and see the very best God has available. Amen. You see, I was thinking as we were worshiping, if you don't get your hope from the Word, you will get your hope from the world. And the hope that the world offers is a very fragile. Could we? I'm going to give you a scripture down that is not on that list. If you go to 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. It says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the Father's not in it. You know, I never dwell on these scriptures because they're not like the rip raw, exciting scriptures for Americans. How many of you know that the world is trying to get you to love the world? If you don't raise your hand, I'm going to come around and preach you. How many of you know the world is trying to get you to love the world? Verse 16. For all that is in the world, 
Now, does this describe, if you go home and turn HBO or something on, does this describe it? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. Does that describe our society? I know it does because it, about 5.36 this morning, I got up while I'm doing stuff. I, put, I tried to put on that same video, that DVD we showed Wednesday night was such an anointing because I love the anointing on that DVD. And I kept pressing it, and it was a different DVD in there. And there were commercials. My kids hadn't watched of anything bad, but the commercials on it were so yuck. And I said, that is not the spirit I'm looking for at 5.30 on a Sunday morning. It is not. Okay. Now, here's what I want you to see. There's very rarely in your week that you would really want a raunchy spirit. Because that raunchy spirit promises you something. It is something that is so fleeting. Keep, keep reading here. It says, verse 16, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. Now, what's wrong with that? If you buy into the world, what's wrong with buying into the world? The wor Read it with me. The world is passing away, and also its lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. Here's what's wrong with the world's hope. The world's hope promises you pleasure for a moment, pleasure for a season, just pleading. The world is passing away, and also its lust, but the one who does the will of God, he said, well, I'm not interested in abiding forever. Are you sure? I want you to see, to, <laughs> some of us are over 50, you know, we're okay with Abiding forever sounds pretty good. Now, if you're 21 or 22, you say, I just want to be cool for the moment. Okay. But there will come a time when you want to under you understand everybody here is making their mark on this world. You will leave this world changed. You will leave people closer to God and more stable in God, or you will leave people with, with broken lives because you did not help them toward God. Wow. Is that, that's not overstated. That's the way that, that's the fact. It says the world is about passing away. I want to teach you today how to shift. You see, what, what happens when we get in a hard place? We have only two options. Do we reach for our true source of help, the Lord Jesus Christ? He, he offers everything we need. He offers the joy that you need to get by on. Do you know you have to have joy to get by on tomorrow? Your body may need a little caffeine, but your spirit has to have some joy. People without any joy at all pull the shades and go to bed. Yeah. Well, listen, all depression is is a lack of joy. You have to have joy. It's not like God doesn't want you to have joy. But you're either going to kind of what doctors call self-medicate with a few Dunkin' Donuts to get a sugar high or whatever it is to keep you going, your hope is either going to come from that fleeting thing from the world or it's going to come from the enduring promises of the Word of God. Hallelujah. 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 Let's go to Romans 15, 13. Let's see our God is a God of hope, eternal hope. Romans 15, 13. Paul writes, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now I've asked you today, what does God want you to do? Say abound in hope. Amen. It doesn't matter which area of your life you look at, whether it's your social relationships or your job or your church family, whichever place you want to turn, God wants you abounding in hope. And what is that hope that every promise that he's ever promised you will be fulfilled? You see, the kingdom of God gives you a promise of far greater hope than any. The world doesn't say, hey, God will fix it. God, they say, get divorced and try again. And I'm not against divorce. If you've been divorced, there's no con condemnation. But please, please, please understand the promises of the kingdom of God are far higher and far better than the promises of this world. But, and you say, well, why, what are you trying to say? If you don't go to this Bible, you won't have Bible hope. Everybody say, Bible hope comes from the Bible. Bible, Bible, Bible. We know that faith does. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. Well, no faith comes, but so does hope. If there is a part of your area, maybe your finances have been really hard. I don't care how hard your finances have been. If you'll get in this word, you'll find out that if you're a son of the living God, God wants you to prosper and it's out there. 
Hallelujah. Let's read this one more time. Just read it with me. I love this verse. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to read it one more time, but it's this thing. You say I and me. Now may the God of hope fill me with all joy and peace in believing so that I may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Quite a couple questions from this verse. First, is hope a godly thing? Yeah. You know, you hear somebody always being positive, you know, they're always positive. Uh, this world is what keeps negative expectations and fear on you. You know? I mean, what do insurance policies thrive on? That you're going to need them, you know? They, they, they put a lot of fear out there. Is hope a godly thing? Yes. Are we like God when we have hope? Yeah. yeah. Hey, can I tell you what? I don't know how your life was, but God was the only one who had hope for me. Everybody but my grandma gave up on me. Yeah. Is there, are you proud of it? No. All I wanted to do was shut the windows, pull the drapes, and go, I don't want to see anybody. You say, that's nothing to be proud of. I'm not proud of it. I'm proud of Jesus. Because I found out that in the worst time in my life, when I was in my early 20s in a horrible depression, he never gave up hope. How many of you in the natural, he should have given up on you and he never gave up hope? You'd be glad he's a God of hope. Thank God. So, and the second question is, what is the outcome of believing that you'd be filled with joy and peace? And then finally, by whose power do we abound in hope? By the power of the Holy Spirit. You've got two voices coming at you all the time. One comes from within, if you're born again. If you're saved, and you will listen to the voice of the Lord, He will always be saying, hey, come on, you can do better than that. You can make it. You can make it in God. And there will always be coming those voices out here saying, the other stuff. Yeah. How many of you know good and well what the devil says? You can give me a try of what the devil says. It, it, there's one piece of good news about that. John 8, 44 says he is a liar and the father of lies. Anytime you can say that to the devil, then you start laughing. I mean, you say, not really. Yeah, if you're alone where nobody thinks you're an idiot, you start laughing. And you say, why would you start laughing? Listen, this is a secret I learned a long time ago from, from Brother Copeland. The devil's very proud. How many of you know he's proud? He tries to get us to be proud. Proud people don't like to be laughed at. I urge you not to laugh at proud people. It's just not. <laughs> Guess what? The devil is a proud person. And when all of a sudden he tells you something, and the Lord has already come through for you five times on the same thing. And you realize that is a lie. Then you just laugh and laugh and laugh. And you will find the joy of the Holy Spirit. Because the Bible says God sits in the heavens and laughs. And he laughs at his enemy, not people at the devil. Hallelujah. Back to the topic of hope. The most awful thing about hell is that there is no hope. It isn't just the dreadful physical agony and emotional agony. It is knowing that there is never, ever, in all of eternity, going to be one moment better. You see, you and I have never been there. We have never been in a place. I mean, even when we're in horrible pain, we have the hope that we're going to get better, that God's going to heal us, or that God, doctor's going to give us something. But we have never been in a place where we have zero hope. Now, this is what the kingdom of God offers you. If hell is on one end with zero hope, Today, God is offering you all hope. Yeah. Even if you're in a hard situation, you have hope that God is going to bring you through some way, somehow, to the other side in victory. And you say, why? Because 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, Thanks be to God who always, Amen. say always, always, always leads us in his triumph in Christ. It doesn't say like 83.5% of the time. That'd be pretty good. If a batter... That's 8, 8.35 or 8.37, whatever that would be. Hey, they're doing good. But God isn't like that. He, he bats a thousand. Say God bats a thousand. Look at what it says. It says, but thanks be to God who always leads us in his triumph in Christ. Now, if you don't know a lot of scripture and you say, Pastor, I'm going to be on the job tomorrow and I'm going to have all this coming at me, then you put yourself a little sticker or a little postcard or something that says, but thanks be to God who always. And you say, what are you doing when you do that? You're, you're giving. That meditation on the word gives hope a cocoon to incubate in. No butterfly could ever become a butterfly without a place to incubate, right? Uh, what they call the chrysalis, right? 
That caterpillar weaves a chrysalis and then it comes out. Your hope, you may be sitting here and saying, yeah, a bunch of words. Listen, there's hope yeah. in that scripture because that scripture is true. Mm -hmm. And if you will give that verse a place to incubate in your spirit, and you say, let thanks be to God. That's what muttering is. Meditation means muttering in the Hebrew. But thanks be to God, always, always. Don't you love that word? Always leads me in this. Think about every part of the verse until it becomes so real to you that you say, I don't care how I get from here to there. He's got a way, and if I will be led by him, I will get there and triumph. Yeah. Isn't that good? Hallelujah. Yeah. Hebrews 11, 1. Let's go there. When you see a promise, and it's bigger than you can even imagine to begin with, you're not in faith yet, but you're starting to get hope. Now look, look at Hebrews 11, 1. It says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The New King James is a little more familiar. Let's read it in the New King James. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Some versions say, now faith gives substance. Say that. Faith gives substance. Faith gives substance. Charles Capps is a faith teacher from way back, and he has the best illustration I've ever heard on this. It says, let's suppose you have somebody way up in the hills and they've never heard of air conditioning. They come down out of the hills and they walk into an air-conditioned house and they say, wow, this feels good. How do you do that? And, oh, and then you walk them up to the thermostat and say, oh, it's really easy. You just move this button cooler if you want it cooler. Says, That's awesome. What do you call those things? Thermostats. So he goes down to the local hardware and he buys a thermostat and he puts it on the wall. And he sits down in his log cabin and put cranks it way up to 55 and waits for it to get cool. And nothing happens. Now, he says, that is the person who has hope. Hope sets the place for your faith to achieve. I have hope that next year I'm going to be a happier, more cheerful person than I am. I've been, you know, I've, I've come down to depression for a lot of years. I'm a pretty happy person now. But it occurs to me lately, you can get happier. You can have more peace. So that's where my hope is set, but guess what? It's going to take faith to give substance. Read this with me. Yeah. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Next week, I want to talk to you about giving substance to your hope, but today, I want to stir up hope for you in the places. I am convinced that every single person here has some area in their lives where they say, I can live with that. Even if it's being sad half the time. Do you know that being sad half the time is not promised to any child of God that I've ever found? Read the New Testament and show me where it says, and be sad half the time. No, it says rejoicing always. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. He said that's impossible. Then why did he say it? He's not crazy. He's not a liar. He said we can rejoice. Hallelujah. God is a God of hope, and God has positive expectations for you in every year of your life. He believes that your finances can improve. He believes and is in agreement with you that your health can improve. He believes that you can live a year pain free. How many of you like to live a day pain free? Okay? It starts with hope that this is possible and announcing it. Hope is your thermostat that sets the expectations of faith. Now it's interesting to note, can we pull up Hebrews 12, 1 and 2? Even in the agony of the cross, Jesus could look beyond Calvary and see his bride. Now think about this. You've got huge, huge spikes through both hands and through your feet. Every, they're spitting at you. They're wagging their tongues at you. saying, oh, if you really God, why don't you climb down and across it? Don't you know his flesh wanted to? Don't you know that every, he had a flesh. He was not like, not really there. He was really there. And his spirit wanted to die for you, but his flesh didn't. How many of you, your flesh, would like to die for the person next to you in a cruel and murderous way? No, he didn't want to be there. How, think about this, how did his spirit went out over his flesh that he stayed? Because the Bible's clear, he could have called 10,000 angels at any moment. We're, we know that, right? It says, therefore, since we have so great, great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin that so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. How? Looking at his example, fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. When he 
For the joy set before him endured the cross. Did he have hope? You better believe it. He had hope and faith. Now how, think about this. If you had been at Calvary that day, you would not have seen any joy there. You would have seen his mama's heart torn out. You would have seen that all the disciples except John were no-shows. you got 11 friends that are with you three and a half years. One of them shows up at your cross. It did not look like a glorious prospect for a glorious church, did it? And yet he had hope. Let me show you where I believe his hope came from. Look at Isaiah 49, 6. You understand that Jesus laid aside his supernatural knowing and became a man. When he learned the scriptures, even though he wrote the scriptures, he became a man and laid aside, it says, his divine privileges. Now this is what he found in the scripture about himself. The Father says it's too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light to the nations so that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Jesus saw in that scripture that the body of people he was dying for would come from every nation on earth. Can you see that? That was the hope set before him on the cross. Look at another one. Look at Psalm 2, 7 and 8. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Now watch this. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance. And the very ends of the earth as your possessions. Those scriptures and many more like them were before the Lord as he hung on that cross, giving him hope that beyond the resurrection, are you hearing me? Even Jonah was a type of his resurrection. That's good. And you say, well, did it pay off? I, I talked about this the other night, but I'm still going to mention it. When, wherever Fury comes three weeks from today, y'all need to come. He was my pastor 30 years ago. He's from New Zealand originally, now from Australia. He was so gracious, he and his wife. They, they fly all over the world. They gave us their flyer months three years ago at the Hillsong Conference. And the thing I wanted to put in here was at the Hillsong Conference in Sydney, Australia, they're in the Olympic Stadium, huge, about 18,000, something like that. So I don't make not quite that many, a lot of thousands of people. The final night, they had a roll call of the nations. And you know, you say, oh, I'm not going to well. Well, you know, when they call, well, you're supposed to cheer when they call your name. A lot of Aussies, a lot of New Zealanders, New Zealanders. a lot of Americans. Yeah. But then they started getting to the islands of the sea. And they'd say Zimbabwe, and people would cheer. Or they'd say South Africa, and people would cheer. The Netherlands, and people would cheer. They had listed 120 nations. And after every one of them, and on a couple of those islands, I could only hear a couple of cheers, but they were there. Yeah. And that's what Jesus was promised when he was hanging there on that cross. He had scripture that promised him the people that loved him from every nation. He said, it's too much. It's too light a thing that you should only die for the Jews. I'll have you for the entire world. Yeah. Those scriptures gave him the hope to hang on to and stay on that cross. Now listen. You have scripture in here, whatever you're going through to hold on to it, that you will come through to a victorious end. Okay? Hallelujah. Now listen to this. Every person who ever got their miracle could see themselves with it before their faith gave substance and hope. When the centurion came to Jesus, we won't take time to go there, but you know, he said, my servant is like fearfully tormented. Now the question, obvious question is, could he see him not fearfully tormented? Now listen, yes. And you say, how do you know? Because if he couldn't, he'd have had no hope and he wouldn't have bothered Jesus. Everybody say, I've got to have hope. Have hope. Okay. And you say, what are you really challenging? Now, if you've been sick for a long time, you need to say, dear God, give me an image of myself vigorously healthy. Yes. Working hard again, happy. Dodie Osteen was just, you know Joel Osteen probably most of you. She's his mama. In the early 1980s, she was diagnosed with liver cancer. My husband actually went to school with her other son, her, Joel's older brother, Paul, who is a doctor. Paul stepped up to his mother's hospital room, read the chart, and started howling like a baby. And in, in Gordon told me, he said, I know Paul, because they're telling a story. And he said, Paul's a very reserved person. When he read the chart, it was a death sentence. They gave her three months. So we're not, you know, liver cancer is not something you want to play with. They said, there's nothing we can do. And they sent her home. Here's what Dodie Osteen did. 
She got every scripture. And she admitted, she said, I always let John believe for me. I, even though she'd been under the word for a lot of years, everybody say, it's time I do my own believing. <laughs> say it one more time. It's time I do my own believing. She got scriptures from every part of the word and put them all out. And then this is what she did. She took down every mirror because she looked like death. She was yelling. She looked like death. Took down every mirror. And she got pictures of herself horseback riding when she was in her 20s and 30s. She got pictures of her and John. Beautiful. You see, Bill's over here smiling because you've been through cancer. You've been through all this and it works. But you had to see yourself in victory, didn't you? You have to get beyond what the enemy is screaming in your ear and get in this word until you see victory, victory, victory. You see your business flourishing. You see yourself without pain. You see yourself able to work a full week. But before your faith can give substance to that, you've got to see. The key is in the sea. If I ever lose hope for this church, it's all over. And I've started two times. I just think, oh, nothing's working. And then why? How many of you know this? Oh, I. Yeah. And you have to get back to the drawing board. And this is the only way I know to read. People yeah. can talk to you forever. You've got to get in this world and see you okay. with joy and, and money and whatever it is for me. Okay, we better hurry and wrap this up. When Mary said, hey, they ran out of wine, could, he, could she see plenty of wine? Yeah, she wouldn't have bothered him if she couldn't. Up. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just feel like I should ask you this. Can you see yourself happy? Can you see yourself strong in God? Yes. Can you see yourself confident even in the face of challenges? You've got to see yourself before you can become that person because faith gives substance to it. Here's one. Can you see yourself paying your bills all at the same time? You just sit down and pay them and sit and figure out. Okay. You know, that's a good thing. And you say, I can't imagine it. Now listen, here's the first key. You get in here. And you take a scripture, like 2 Corinthians 8 9, where it says, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was poor, yet for, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. Can you bring that up? 2 Corinthians 8 9 it says, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Now, a lot of people say, You shouldn't say that. I didn't. No. Okay. Who, who wrote this scripture? Paul. Does it use the word rich? Is it a four-letter word? Yeah. But he's the Bible. Oh, now listen. I believe with all my heart that God wants his folks to prosper. I do believe that if you read the word, the prosperity program includes financing the kingdom because the kingdom is what's on God's heart. For you to say, you're number one in my life and I don't care two cents about your kingdom. Yeah, it's really hard to put that together. I'm just telling you, it's hard to put that together. And you say, well, why would you dare talk about money? Well, guess what the chair you're sitting in cost? Guess what this microphone costs? Money. Okay, I'm just telling you, this is... And you say, well, couldn't God have just showered down and go over? For sure he could have. He did not have to make you and me participators in the gospel in any way, shape, or form. He could have had angels preach the gospel. He could have showered gold from heaven. But that was not his plan. No. And you say, why did he do it the money way this way? Well, for one thing, he finds out where your heart is. Jesus is wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. This may sound a bit backwards, but if you sell me, I know I don't love the kingdom of God like I should, but you'll put your treasure there. The Bible says your heart follows your treasure. Yeah. All right. And you say, okay, what are the other key? I, I just, if you're tithing and you're faithful, and you say, why isn't it working? The first thing I say is, are you tithing with joy? And are you tithing with great love? Now let, wait, it's really quiet in here. The reason anything in heaven works is love. If you need a healing miracle or somebody you know needs a healing miracle, the only thing that will make your faith work is love. Galatians 6, 7 says faith works by love. If I pray, I pray for my kids, it's really easy. Oh, these are my kids if you're busy. I love them. If I love you and I pray for you, my faith will work. Are you following me? Yeah. Now when you give, I don't have an offering that's what I used to have, and I just... Okay, and I do it with the same exact feeling that I pay the light bill. 
God is still honored that you obey him. But it doesn't have the same effect in the kingdom. Please listen. Everything in the kingdom works by love. Yeah. Yeah. Your worship only works by love. You can hold your hands up here, but if you don't love him, it's not the same. Can you understand that part? When you give to the kingdom, it says God loves a cheerful giver. Why? Because if, if I'm a cheerful giver, it's because I love the kingdom of God. I love what's happening in this place. You don't have to give to this place. If you don't believe what's happening here, that's okay. But it's nuts not to give anywhere and say God's first in your life. Because you see, I don't care what you This is true. Because the Lord has used this to say, you know, it's, it's fair. It's 10% is what he asks for. When you bring the 10% and you bring it in great love, then what you do, now listen, you do it in love and joy. Okay? And then you go to Malachi 10, and you and your husband, if you're married, or your wife, if you're married, or if you're single, just do it by yourself. Lay Malachi 10, or 310 before the Lord. I want to show you how to claim the scripture. Maybe you know this, but you need to. Okay. First of all, would you go to Jeremiah 215, 315, and then we'll go to Malachi 3. I know I'm switching up. But I don't need something else. Do you understand that if you know how to play, uh, claim a scripture, you can get whatever you need from God? Claiming a scripture is just sort of an old-fashioned way of saying you see it in the word, you accept the faith that's in that word, and that faith is in your heart, and you say, now God, I expect you to do it. A lot of people, that terrifies them. Uh -huh. You would go to God and expect him to do it. Well, the day you got saved, when you came to him, did you expect him to take you in? John 6 says, the one who comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. How many of you, when he said that, you expect him to take you in because he said he wouldn't cast you out? All right? And I want to tell you about this scripture. Oh, can we go to Jeremiah 2, 315? I know I'm switching up. We'll come right back here, can we? Jeremiah 315. I want to tell you that, can I tell you the circumstances? I'm a brand new Christian, practically. Just got filled with the Spirit. We were going to a denominational church, and we got a hold of the Word of Faith message that God always wants to heal, God always wants to empower. We were so excited. We were in Springfield, Massachusetts. My dad was president of the university there. And he was teaching something that's called the college career class, which is after you graduate from college or high school, you went there until you were about 25. It was a big church in a big city. And as he began to teach these principles, the kids started getting miracles. Do you know God loves to do miracles? You just step out and work. And we were in a Pentecostal church that hadn't seen a miracle in a long time. We weren't trying to prove anybody up. We were just excited that God answered prayer. You follow me? We had 100 kids in the college career class. And the pastor came and asked us to leave. And I couldn't. I mean, I tied. I had learned about the gifts. I mean, this was the first spiritual church. I couldn't fathom that. And he said, yes, last week you encouraged them to go see Noah's Ark in the theater. And we don't believe in going to theaters. Wow. Well, that was because it was prospering. So here I am. So we are sitting in a town of 180,000 in Springfield, Mass. I'm not trying to get you to feel sorry for me, okay? Things turned out okay. This happened. Do you understand that pastors are, are people too? Pastors can make mistakes. Pastors can feel insecure and threatened too. Have a little mercy for pastors. I don't, I don't, I'm not bad at the man. He was scared because the play, the, the college and career class was soon going to be as big as his whole church. It's scared. So here we are sitting in a town of 100, and there was not another Pentecostal church. I mean, there was not. And I say, God, I'm going to go to church. And if you've ever been in spiritual circles, it's really hard to go back to a place where they don't expect the presence of God. It's just hard. And I'm reading along in my Bible feeling really, really bad and friendless. And I found that scripture. Look at that scripture. It says, then I will give you shepherds. Do you know what the word pastor means? In Spanish, pastor is shepherd. It means shepherd. In the Greek, okay? Then I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you a knowledge and understanding. Wow. That's what I wanted. So I took it to my mom and dad. I was grown, but living at home with the mass mutual. I said, look at this. He said he'd give us shepherds after his own heart who feed us on knowledge and understanding. And you say, well, did you have a word from God? Yeah, right there. Amen. Don't wait for God to strike you with lightning. He's spoken. Right. You didn't get struck with lightning before you came to him. It says, the one who comes to me, I will in no way cast out. And you took it and you got it. Yeah. That was about July. No, 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 no. We, left the, we were asked to leave the church in September. So in about late September, early October, I found that scripture. I mean, my heart was dancing. God said it, 
And he was not going to let us down. So we're up there. This is many, many years ago. There weren't any word of faith churches. We didn't call Raymond. We didn't do anything. We just stood on one verse of scripture for four months before anything happened. In January, well, okay, found out later, two months after I started seeing the scripture, Al Fury, who will be here three weeks from today, and yes, he still has his Aussie accent, and yes, he's still in your face Aussie, isn't he? But we all love him to pieces, and you will get something out of this ministry you won't get from anybody else. He had a vision, and in this vision, he was, had been an evangelist for a number of years, and in the vision, he saw a Marriott Hotel, and he saw himself start a church at that Marriott Hotel. But God didn't tell him where. He said, okay, God, if you ever want me to start it, tell me where. That's how he talked to God, the way he talks to us. So anyhow, in January, he held a meeting in West Springfield, Mass. And I went over there because, man, I was hungry for fellowship. And in West Springfield, Mass, he's announced that in March, he was going to be starting a church. The Lord had given me a word very, very clearly. I just want you to know that God's supernatural. Do you hear me? Don't limit God to the natural. God's not natural. How's God natural? He created the heaven and earth natural. He got you born again natural. Natural wouldn't take care of you, honey. You had to have supernatural rebirth. So God had spoken to my heart. and Because he, I was saying, how long can we go together without having a church? And he said, you will worship together as a family on Easter Sunday morning. So at these meetings in January, he and I was going to start a church. Because that week, going in town for those meetings, he had driven by the Marriott. You can see it from whatever that highway is. I can't spend too many years. And he, God said, there's your Marriott. Start the church. So he announced it. I bring my parents. I drag them across town, half, 40, half an hour, 45 minutes. And he, said, and he says, well, you've got it. He, and then the, my dad said, my, Denise got a word from God that we worship together as a family on Easter Sunday morning. And he said, well, my dear, you only missed it by a week. We're starting on Palm Sunday. But listen. My dad was in St. Louis attending a conference on Palm Sunday on Easter. Guess what? God fulfilled his word. And, and he said, why are you still so happy about this? All these years later, I'm, look, those were four hard months. I was new and gone. I was lonely. I said, where's my fellowship? I did not have extreme. You understand? If tomorrow, guys, you couldn't come to extreme, turn your ear. Come on. I was on my fellowship. Those were hard months. But I want to tell you something. When you get on a scripture and you don't move, Guess what God does? He moves. Wow. When you won't move God, that's good. No, yeah. Okay, go to Malachi 3. Some of you have been tithing and not seeing the results. The promised. First of all, if you've given grudgingly, this is between you and God, not anybody else, but if you've given because you know it's the right thing to do, but you sure don't want to. How many nights? Listen. You know I'm trying to help you. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to. One time, let me tell you a dad hated story. I would love you to tell dad hated it. Have you came back again? He's so sweet. After he had gone from being a prosperous pastor to two years out on the road, he had run his vehicle into the ground. He was preaching prosperity and had nothing. And he said, God, you said in Isaiah chapter 1 that if you'd be willing and obedient, you'd eat the, you'd eat the best of the land. And, and he said, I've been obedient. And he said, yeah, but you haven't been willing. Everything you've been doing is against your will. And Dad Higgins always said, trust me, honey, it doesn't take long to get a willing. In just a moment, God willing something, I'm willing now. And God's our prospering. Now, I'm trying to tell you how to not have to give any more if you're already tithing. But to get blessed. If you've been get, I'm really trying to help you. Not just, if you've been giving... But you've been grudging and you've been doing it and you know you don't want to. Say, well, guess what? I can make an adjustment. Yeah. Lord, I'm grateful. I'm a cheerful giver. Yeah. I'm willing yeah. and being, and I'm giving a great joy. Okay, yeah. now if you've done that, Good. then you here's what you do. Verse 10, Malachi 3 10 says, You bring it into the storehouse, and that's where you're getting fed, so that there may be food in my house. Now you see, God explains it all. You're sitting there thinking, why? Should I be taught? Okay. Real fast question. Is this food to you today? Is it feeding you? Yes. Are you growing? Yes. yes. Spiritual food is as real as physical food. You wouldn't think of, not, of going home and not having lunch. 98% of us will have lunch today, right? But listen, your spirit is a real person. Your spirit man needs food. Jesus didn't mention not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. When he says, bring the tithe and so there may be food, that doesn't mean the granola bars. We gave the kids granola bars, but that's not what he's talking about. 
It's talking about spiritual food that you eat where your spirit is eating the word of God. Bring the tithe so that there may be food in my house and test me. Okay, now this is what you do. But I was saying that on Jeremiah 3.15, I said, God, you promised. You promised me a shepherd who would teach me. I don't know nothing. I Please send me the shepherd. You put your little feet on that scripture in the spirit. Yeah. And you get on um, Malachi 3.10. And if, it's, if you're married, I'm almost done here. I'll keep you more than five minutes long longer. But listen. If you're married, you do this as a couple because your finances are joined. And you say, Lord, you said to test you. Now, we're, we're testing you. We're happy to give. We're happy. We love your kingdom. We've given. Now, you promised a blessing until it overflows. And other translations say until there's no room. There's not room enough. I still have room. VB&T has not called me saying your, your account is maxed out. We can't insure it anymore than there's room. Yeah. And you say, okay. Yeah. And you say, why are you saying these things for the tithers? Yeah. For the people who kept the lights on this week? Uh -huh. Because you have a right to be blessed. But I have found in my own life, I'll tell you a secret, I don't think about money very much. And you say, why? Well, if I thought about money very much, I would have left about 27 years ago. We've been here 28 years. <laughs> so I figured out a long time ago that if money was going to be a big deal, I'm going to have to leave. It's not about money. So I don't think about it enough to tell the truth. But I found on the first, first week in August, I've been giving and giving and giving. I say, God, this is going to have to stop. <laughs> I've got to have help this week. I was expecting it in the mail, and then I found out I had made a $1,500. I had subtracted $750 to that. Except 50. And he said, well, that went to God. He couldn't have told me that that day. <laughs> but all I know is that when... <laughs> You feel I'm saying it was just like somebody handed it to me. I didn't know I had it. If you've not been seeing the return that you believe you should, then you need to do exactly with Malachi 3.10, but I did with Jeremiah 3.15. Lord, you promised. Yeah. You're not rude, but you're insistent. God loves it. You know why? Because it takes faith to do that. For all those that aren't tithing, that's just let it go over your head. But the tithers deserve to hear that. They paid the bill so you could be here today. Amen. Is that some way I say amen? amen. Yeah, that's awful claim in here. Okay, so do you have hope? Is there any area of hope? Let's go to Lamentations. We're halfway through the notes and we're quitting, so be of be good cheer. <laughs> Did you know that God's word works? Yeah, yeah. This is true. This is, everything you see here has been built on God's work. Yeah. People are alive today. Sherry, what were you diagnosed with cancer? That was bad. Bill. Carolyn. She had a steer we had to back down a month ago. And you said, oh, I don't believe. Don't believe it. We don't care. Yeah. If you tell us you're not, it's okay. Leave us alone. We're happy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Jeremiah was in one of the worst places you could be in. He has watched Jerusalem be burned by a foreign enemy. The young nobles were led off to Babylon. The temple's in ruin. And yet look what he says. He said, this I recall to mind. Therefore, I have hope. Say, I have hope. I have hope. Next verse. The Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease. For his compassions never fail. Why does he have hope? Because God's love never quits. Say that. God's love never quits. And I want to tell you something. There's places where you've said it's okay. If I'm sort of half sad half the days, it's okay. And God says, uh-uh. I said, the choice and the dollars. I'm trying to help you. I'm not trying to hurt you. Some of you look like you're trying to hold on to that. Sad. Why does he have hope? Because God's love doesn't quit. His loving kindness has never ceased. His compassions never fail. Now watch this. They are new every morning. Now you can tell me. Remember last week I tried to, I argued for 10 minutes of your time in the Bible every single morning. And I never did. His mercy is brewed fresh every morning as much as your coffee is. If Starbucks decides tomorrow they're going to sell day-old coffee, they will be out of business in how many of you paid five dollars for a cup of day old coffee? Uh-uh. Now listen, it says his mercy is new every morning. I'm telling you that if you try to live on yesterday's mercy, okay, let's go back. 
Do you remember the story of the manna? How often did they have to gather? Every morning. It's spoiled overnight if they kept it overnight. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying his love spoils overnight, but it's not as fresh. He wants you to have a fresh batch of his love every single morning. You say, why? Because that'll birth hope in you. Yeah. Man, you guys are really. uh, I don't know about you, but I need fresh mercy. Yeah. Say, I need fresh mercy. I need fresh mercy. Every morning. I've had tons of other stuff, but let me, I, I, have, I have heard this story, two stories in a little clip. When they um, dedicated Disneyland, Walt Disney was still alive, and he thought. Then they built Disney World, and halfway through building Disney World, he died. And down in Orlando, when they were having his dedication service, or the dedication service of Disney World, the speaker said, oh, we wish Walt could have seen this. And his widow sat there and interrupted and said, he did. He saw every facet, every detail. You know why the man became rich? Because he had a tremendous imagination. He was a great imaginer. And then he knew how to put feet to his dreams. Yeah. If you can blow this message off for a long time, I didn't want to hear any messages on hope. I thought they were not substantial enough. Oh. <laughs> Isn't that funny? You go. But for you to be strong in God, you've got to let get in here and let God develop an image of you, yeah. powerful true, God. True. Able to say no to temptation. Yeah. Full of the Holy Spirit. Full of joy. Full of a word in due season for the people you work with to encourage them. You've got to get an image of you super incredibly successful in God. Yeah, true. You say, I don't care. Well, you, you, your faith will never go anywhere until you see it. And if you can't see it, you say, but Pastor, I just can't see it. I understand that. That's why I write you the sermon. Hallelujah. Guess where the seer is? Uh -huh. your, light, your word is a light. Yeah. The vision for your life is right in here. Jesus found it and stayed on the cross because of it. If you want to see yourself successful, the others, the other, I heard an interview just this week and close with this. They were interviewing Condoleezza Rice. I think it was Diane Sawyer. And she said, how did you ever become this successful? Secretary of State. You know where she grew up? She grew up in Southern Alabama during segregation. Her parents could not even take her to lunch at the lunch counter. Her parents could not take her to the movie. But she said, in spite of that, they had me absolutely convinced I could be president of the United States if that's what I wanted. <laughs> they put an image of hope in her so magnificent that nobody could ever tell her, no, she already had it on the inside. And I don't care how many times the devil has told you you're depressed and that's just the way you are. God's not agreeing with that. Amen. And if you'll get in this word, he will birth hope in you. Hope for joy. Hope for good, happy marriage. I know marriages can get better because ours did. Tell them what the day my husband went home, our, our marriage got better. Again, I was, a, I was a mess. I knew everything when we got married. I thought I should let him know. I thought I should say everything that was on my mind. Why is anybody laughing? Please tell me. <laughs> but do you know that God, you know that, that you, you can have a sweeter after 60 years of marriage, can't you, than on the first year? Somebody told me that the first year is the best year. I thought, well, that's sure depressing. <laughs> <laughs> now, we'll conclude on this note. If you've been born again for a year, it's an awesome year. But it's not your best year. Amen. The best year will be next year. Remember how we read John 2 when the head waiter tasted the wine? He said, You'll save the best until Amen. now. Remember? Not last. Now. Everybody's saying, He's saving the best for now. Yes. Yes. Yes.